Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein webinar series on COVID-19. I'm Dr. Gary Severance, and with 90% of dental practices back in business, we're hearing positive feedback. For more about that, let's go to Dr. David Resnick. Dr. Resnick? Uh, thank you, Gary, as always. And as always, it's a pleasure to be on this journey with you as we reopen as we start to see our patients, as we start to use our skill sets, and as we do everything in our power to make sure that our patients and that our teams remain safe as we move forward. I wanted to start off with some good news, um, which is a, maybe a bit of a change. The American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute polling showed re robust and sustained rebound for some of our dental offices. And that's the first time um, we've actually been able to say something that positive. This poll indicated that 90% of dental practices had reopened as of the week of June 1, up from 65% in mid-May and 3% in April. As we all know, the dental uh, industry has taken a significant hit. We personally have taken a significant hit, but we're making progress. We're coming back. The poll also found that patient volume had reached over 50% in pre-COVID-19 levels. So that, again, is encouraging information. We're getting patients in. We're doing some more routine care. Um, and then dentists or dental health care personnel who'd like to look at the results, they're broken down by practice size. You can look at dental service organization status. You can even look at the state level and look at all ways of the survey. So you can stay informed. The whole key and why you tuned in today is to try to stay informed in public health settings and private practices so we can all safely and securely manage and do what we all know how to do so well. Another good piece of news, Dennis got back to work in May, leading health job gains, which is remarkable. Dental offices added 245,000 jobs in May. Basically, healthcare overall added 312,000 jobs, and most of them came from ambulatory settings such as dentist physicians' offices. But 78% of the added jobs to the healthcare sector were related to dentistry, and that is a great sign for us. We all know that um, we've all been through that, but the COVID-19 shutdowns, and we lost basically a half a million jobs in April. So now we've added about a half of the workforce that we lost back. We still have a ways to go. We all know we're not at 100% yet, but we're getting there. Employment is still down from where it was in March for dentists and the wider healthcare sector, but we are making progress, and that's some good news. The May bounce back in settings where many healthy people go for routine and checkups might be an early indication of the comfort levels of coming to see us post-COVID. I think people are more anxious about going to the hospital settings. We're still seeing a reduction in the number of emergency department visits around the country. So I think it's a good sign for us that, that uh, we develop trust with our patients, um, our hygienists and, and, and our dental assistants and the dentist and front desk. All of our teams have developed trust with those uh, we have served all these years, and it looks like there's confidence in coming back, and I think that's important. So let's talk a little bit about asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection and the prevalence. There was an excellent study that was put together in the Annals of Internal Medicine and it's been suspected that infecting persons who were made asymptomatic play a significant role in the ongoing pandemic. And, and for those of you who have been watching the news, we will address the WHO statement in, in a few minutes. But the relative number of asymptomatic transmission or pre-symptomatic transmission um, has been uncertain. So they went and reviewed and synthesized available evidence. And, and the sourcing is on the slide. Asymptomatic persons seem to account for approximately 40 to 45 percent of COVID-19 infections, which is completely different than what the WHO said on uh, Tuesday. They have changed it now. And then the, the other thing is that they can transmit the virus to others for extended periods, perhaps longer than the initial 14 days. So again, this is a new pandemic. We're learning as we go through. Because of the high risk of silent spread for asymptomatic uh, individuals, it's imperative that testing programs include those without symptoms. I can say the hospital I worked at received a pretty substantial uh, grant today in order for us to test symptomatic and asymptomatic people so we have a better idea of where the disease is in our community. 
So just looking back at some of the things you might have heard on the news, we remember the first, that, that ill-fated cruise ship, the Diamond Princess, as of March 16, 712, or almost 19% of the passengers and crew had tested positive. At the time of testing, 331, or 46.5% of those positive results were asymptomatic. If you look at results from a Boston homeless shelter, amongst 408 occupants, 147 tested positive, which 88% were asymptomatic. Again, a lot of, of infection seems to be related to asymptomatic or presymptomatic transmission. And in L.A. homeless shelter, 43 of the 178 completed tests were positive for SARS-CoV-2 and 27 or 64% of the persons who tested positive were asymptomatic. And in New York City, obstetrics patients between March 22nd and April 4th, women who delivered infants at two New York City hospitals were tested for SARS-CoV-2. Among 214 patients, 33% tested positive, and of those, 88% were asymptomatic. Rutgers University students and employees. On March 21st through April 7th, researchers recruited 829 students and employees at Rutgers University and two affiliated hospitals for SARS-CoV-2 testing. 546 were healthcare workers. In total, 41 or about 5% tested positive among healthcare workers, a higher percentage, 40 or 7.3% tested positive, compared with 1% of those in one or 0.4% in other fields. So you can see healthcare workers are more at risk, and we are in people's face, which is why we've really been talking about these face-fitting respirators and full face shields and the things we need to do to, to stay safe in the office. San Francisco residents in the Mission District, 74, or 1.8% tested positive, of which 52.7, around 53%, were asymptomatic. So we're testing a lot of folks, and we're finding a lot of asymptomatic spread. So what I thought I would do is talk about asymptomatic versus presymptomatic. I'll be frankly honest, I had to look it up. Um, to me, asymptomatic means that you just don't have symptoms and that you could have a disease. You could be asymptomatic and, and live with HIV. Um, but asymptomatic people, as I found out, were people who never develop symptoms compared to what they're calling pre-symptomatic, who will eventually present with symptoms. So there is the, the difference. If, if you're like me and you struggled with that, and I did, and I'm honest about it, I found the definition on, on the two for you. So it was actually on Monday, the WHO statement in, in Redux, and just I didn't go through the, put the whole paper here for you. They basically said that while asymptomatic spread can occur, it's very rare. And that caused a huge, huge explosion of infectious disease physicians, um, nurses, um, people from all over um, in healthcare fields basically saying this is just not true. And so on the next day, um, they released a new statement on Tuesday. They wanted to clarify this controversy and say that asymptomatic spread of coronavirus, when they said it was very rare, saying that much is unknown and some models find that it is not actually rare. I just went over about seven models, six or seven models, where it was not rare. So for us to think that if you're asymptomatic, you're not going to be at risk when you're around people who aren't coughing or have a fever, that is not the case. So please maintain social distancing. Please, when you're outside um, uh, and then going to a, an office or shopping or grocery store, please wear a mask. Please protect yourself. I hope that sort of helps to settle that. There were some issues on selecting an appropriate mask or facial fitting respirators. And this I thought was sort of interesting. Based on um, 2004 literature that review on aerosols done by um, Harold and, and a colleague and friend of mine, uh, John Molinari, ultrasonic scaling has been shown to produce the greatest amount of aerosol and splatter contamination due to the comp composition of particles of varying size, which range from 0 0.001 to 100, says another incredibly resourceful person, a Leanne Keeper, um, who's Director of Clinical Services and Education for Crosstex International, which is a part of Hugh Freedy. So this is literally from Leanne's presentation, and I thought it was important because if you looked at the CDC interim guidelines, they say that avoid uh, aerosol generating procedures, avoid using the air water syringe together, avoid um, high-speed handpieces. 
And then it says, do not use the ultrasonic scaler, and this is the reason why. So ASTM International, let's talk about the levels of um, face masks. I think that's an issue that sometimes confuses people. Um, ASTM was uh, formerly known as the American Society for Testing and Materials. It's an international standard organization that develops and publishes voluntary consensus of technical standards for a wide range of materials, products, systems, and services. Um, so there's a lot, of, and it's located about five miles northwest of Philadelphia. So on face masks, the latest version of the standard specifying performance of face masks, ASTM F2100-11, was released in April of 2011. Face mask material performance is based on testing for fluid resistance, bacterial filtration efficiency, particulate filtration efficiency, breathability, which is very important, and comfort, as well as flammability. An ASTM level one face mask, it's ideal for procedures where there's a low amount of fluid spray or aerosols, like good exams, or cleaning the operatory, because you know we want the operatory to sit for 15 minutes now, and then when the, the staff comes in to clean it, a regular level one face mask is fine. For impressions, lab trimming, finishing and polishing, and ortho procedures. For level two face masks, these are for light, uh, ideal for procedures where there's light to moderate amounts of fluid spray and or aerosols, limited oral surgery, endodontics, prophylaxis. But again, when using prophylaxis, according to the American Dental Hygiene Association, we really don't want to polish all the teeth at this point. Just try to get the stain off and not to use the air polisher. You can do restorative and composite. Remember, that will produce an aerosolized generating procedure, and then we really need to have an N95 on. Sealants, a level 2 mask is fine. For level 3 masks, these are ideal procedures for moderate to heavy amounts of fluid. This is the most fluid resistant of the uh, face mask and or aerosols produced and uh, procedures. And this was done before, uh, before COVID-19. I want you to know that. For complex oral surgery, crown preps, implant placement, perio, use of ultrasonic scalers, and laser-based applications. For laser-based applications, I've never agreed with that recommendation. I've always used N95 because of the plume. And in our present environment, although the level three face mask, if you have a staff person that cannot wear N95, they can wear the level three and a full face shield. And I, as I've mentioned before, if you have uh, staff members who have bad asthma or breathing issues, they might not be able to wear the N95 or equivalent. There are other options that you can look up on the elastometric and things of that sort, but everything is hard to find right now. So um, I really, if you have a person who has a hard time breathing, a level three with a full shield will be fine. This is what we should be using. This is the N95. Remember, we've already talked about making sure that you check with the FDA when you're purchasing these. If you're purchasing them from a major um, company like Henry Schein, you shouldn't have to worry. The issue that we've had is the shortage. So um, for the members of the American Dental Association, um, they have secured um, some uh, uh, N95s from the reserves, and they will be distributing um, them to the local dental association. So maybe that will be one way to help you get started. And, and hopefully our manufacturers and our distributors will be able to keep up with this new need that caught everybody by surprise, including everybody in the dental field. So for recommendations for reopening of dental services, and this is looking at the international sources from the Cochrane Oral Health Review, which is very well respected. It looked at national recommendations for restructuring and reopening of dental services from 16 countries. I sort of wanted to see where we were and compared to where other countries were. And it's, of course, going to be highly variable around the world. Most sources recommend patient triage by telephone something we're doing. Some also recommend tele uh, temperature screening at reception. We are doing both of these. So we are triaging patients on the phone, and we are taking temperature and asking questions upon entry. Most sources recommend avoiding aerosolized generating procedures if possible. We are still there as we're awaiting some new equipment. Most sources recommend surgical masks for non-COVID-19 cases not requiring aerosolized generating procedures, which I think is fine. Most sources recommend filtering face piece class 2, so the European is the FFP2 equivalent to N95 or the KN95 mask, for non-COVID-19 cases undergoing aerosolized generating procedures and all suspected or confirmed COVID-19 cases undergoing any procedure. 
Sources include recommendations on how to reduce the risk of transmission, such as preoperative mouthwashes. There's still research going on there. High volume suction, rubber dams, and personal protective equipment. All sources emphasize the need to focus on activities that minify risk to staff, patients, and public. And I've really been hitting on that since the beginning of this webinar series, but still support the, the provision of high quality dental care. There is a need to consider the interrelationship between the appropriate use of PPE, doffing and donning, aerosol generating procedures, and interventions to reduce aerosol generation. So there's several steps. It's not just one thing that you can do, but several steps that make sure you have the safest office possible. Donning and doffing, um, I'm going to go back to Ebola. Remember, there were cases. This is not Ebola. This is not as contagious as Ebola. It's not, you know, the outcomes are different than Ebola. But we had people who were infecting themselves by taking off or doffing their uh, PPE. So this is a wonderful poster that's from the CDC. It was easy to find. Um, I just wanted to give you another resource. You might want to print this out from the CDC and have visible signs up so your staff can help them. I actually went over this again today in our morning huddle. Special considerations for religious or cultural reasons. This came up as a question um, during the last webinar, and, and regretfully, I wasn't able to participate due to a minor procedure on my back. So recommendations for males with head coverings, a uh, yarmulke, for instance, a bonnet or surgical cap will offer protection and then continue with your full PPE. Recommendations for females with head and face covers, and the example I use this is a job, I ideally ask the team member to consult with the local imam to see if it would be possible to wear a headscarf only at work, as that would work with the N95 or equivalents to remove after each patient. It's also important that we provide space for the team member to change in private. N95 are not fixed on ears or over the back of the head, so can be technically placed and removed over the hijab. There are also some hijabs that are available that are disposable. YouTube has multiple videos on placing a mask or a face filtering respirator over a hijab. So I, I did want to get that answer in, and, and I regret that I wasn't able to answer it last week, but hopefully that does address the concern. And then there was a real good, interesting conversation, um, a little bit in the weeds, but it was on antibody testing from the NIH director's blog. So this was a conversation with Dr. Collins and Dr. Sharpless, who's director of NIH National Cancer Institute. So there's been a great deal, and we're talking about reliable antibody testing, and we do have some reliable antibody testing. They normally involve a blood draw. Um, we don't have reliable point-of-care testing, to my knowledge, at this point, and that's something that is evolving rapidly. So there's been a great deal of discussion about whether people who recover from COVID-19 have neutralizing antibodies in their bloodstream to guard against another infection. There's a lot of interest in data that continues to come out, including a recent reprint from researchers at um, a lab in Brooklyn. They tested over 11,000 people for antibodies in May at a local urgent care facility and found that nearly half have long-asting Ig antibodies, a sign of exposure to COVID-19. Researchers also found a direct correlation between the severity of a person's symptoms and their levels of Ig antibodies. The study and others remind us of just how essential antibody tests will be going forward to learn about the challenging pandemic. The assays have to have a remarkably high sensitivity and specificity, meaning very few false negatives and very few false positives. If you get the wrong information, like we've seen with some of these rapid tests that have been used, that doesn't really do much. And so while there are some good tests out there, like the blood draw test, they're not all equally reliable. So antibodies are proteins that your body makes as a part of a, a learned immune system. It's the immunity that responds if you're uh, infected by a bacteria or a virus. In general, if you draw someone blood after an infection and they test for the presence of these antibodies, you can often know whether they've been infected, and that's what we're looking at at this point. And they can hang around for quite some time. How long COVID-19 antibodies last is really what we're looking at, and, and what will they provide? They will let us know if somebody's had the disease, but do they provide protection? So we don't really know the answer to how long. We think most people infected with coronavirus will make antibodies at a reasonably high level in their peripheral blood within a couple weeks of infection. So what do these antibodies tell us about the virus? 
You can use an antibody assay to try and tell how many people in your area has been infected. And that's what the grant that my hospital just got will help us determine. So it's basically a seroprevalence study. You could also potentially, keyword, potentially use these antibody assays to protect someone's resistance to further or future infection although the science of this is not proven. So we do not know if these antibodies are effective or not. So for somebody who does not have antibodies, who apparently was previously infected, do they need to stop worrying about getting exposed? Serious answer here, no, not at this point. To use antibodies to protect who's likely to be immune, you've got to have a few things that happen. First, can the test actually measure the antibodies reliable? And we have some that can do that. But if you're, if you're um, Trying to detect something that is more common, like with the outbreak in Manhattan, we think the tests are up to the test. If you're in a small rural area, a lot of times where you don't have a great number of prevalence, the tests aren't as, as accurate. Second, does the appearance of antibody in peripheral blood mean that you're actually immune and you're less likely to get the virus? And as I said, we just don't know yet. So there's a lot that we're still learning. This is an ongoing effort to manage this pandemic. Um, I'm happy to see that our profession is beginning to uh, come back to a new state of normal. And I look forward to talking to you next week to see if we have some more positive information to share. Thank you. And back to you, Gary, as always. Thank you, Dr. Resnick, for that clinical update. Now, if you have any questions, concerns, or f ideas for future topics, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel to get the latest notifications. Until we see you again, stay safe and stay informed.